Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us to the Mayoral Candidates Education Town Hall 2024, sponsored by the Baltimore Teachers Network. They're here this evening with us. I am Denise Koch. We are streaming this live on CBS News Baltimore and on other networks. And again, we thank you for joining us. For the next two hours, we are going to tackle the subject of education in Baltimore City public schools. Our students, our schools, our future. That's the title. What's working? What needs improvement? And what are the mayoral candidates' ideas for the future, to make it a better future for our students? Now, based on recent polling, the Baltimore Teachers Network invited the top four candidates to join us here on stage tonight, and they are here. The remaining 12, they were offered an opportunity to speak to you for three minutes on their plans for education. You will hear from those candidates, those who chose to participate later in this program. So I'm joined here on the moderator's table by two city school teachers. Right next to me is Jason Rose, a 9th through 12th grade social studies teacher at Carver Vocational Technical Senior High School. And on his left is Aaron Topp, a second grade teacher at William Packer Elementary School. So initially, this is how it's going to work. Initially, the three of us will be posing a series of prepared questions. And then a little later, we will have questions from the audience, things that you at home might be asking yourselves. And we'll be taking those as well. Each candidate will be given two minutes to respond to each question. If a candidate is called out directly, they will then be given one minute to rebut. It is my job, sitting here, to keep us on topic. And the topic again tonight is education. That's what we're here to talk about, and that's the subject we're going to tackle. So it's arguably one of the most important for the future of our city, for the future of our city. And that's why we're giving it this kind of time and attention. It is also my job to be on time of the timing. So I may, from time to time, have to interrupt. I apologize in, in advance for that. That's my job, and I got to try and keep us moving ahead the way that the format recalls. All right, let me introduce the candidates, if I can. And they are in the order in which they're seating. First, we have Thiru Vignaraja, born and raised. We're allowed to cheer now. Later, we're asking you to hold your applause. Raised uh, in Baltimore City and attended Baltimore City Schools, then attended Yale University, Harvard Law School. He was a federal prosecutor in the US Attorney's Office and Deputy Attorney General for the state of Maryland. He is running for mayor as a Democrat. Next to him, we have Wendy Bozell, running for mayor as a Democrat. She was director of Muscular Dystrophy and Cerebral Palsy Association. She left that position in order to become a city school teacher. She is a single mom to three daughters. She's got my respect. And she is president of the Upper Fells Point Association, Wendy Bozell. Then to her left, we have Donald Scoggins. He is running as a Republican for mayor of the city of Baltimore. He is an affordable housing professional and consultant. He is a founder and owner of Scoggins Properties, a DC-based real estate firm focused on small investors. And he co-founded the nonprofit Frederick Douglass Housing Corporation, which also focuses on low-income housing. He is retired military. He served in Vietnam. Thank you for your service, sir. And he lives in the city's Madison Park neighborhood. And to his left is running as a Democrat, Sheila Dixon. She was elected city council in 1987. She was elected city council president in 1999. She became the 48th mayor of the city of Baltimore in 2007. Sheila attended Baltimore City Schools, Towson University, and Johns Hopkins University. She lives in southwest Baltimore. The, the current mayor, Mayor Brandon Scott, accepted our invitation to attend and then late this afternoon sent us this statement. And I am quoting Mayor Scott. Unfortunately, I'm unable to join you tonight due to an anti-violence event that requires my attendance. Making Baltimore safer has been my top priority as mayor. We've been able to reduce homicides and non-fatal shootings, working in partnership with the community, turning the page on the failed approaches of the past. We've invested more in education, 
recreation and our seniors than any administration before. I look forward to sharing my vision for keeping Baltimore moving forward at another time in the near future. Now is not a time to look backwards. Thank you." Unquote. So, all right, we're going to begin now. Each candidate has been given one minute to make a statement, again, on the subject of education in our schools. And as with all the answers to the questions, we're going to go in the order of the chairs. So through, if you would start, please, with your opening statement. Thank you, Denise. Thank you so much for coming out uh, this evening. My name is Thiru Vignaraja, and even if I wasn't the son of two Baltimore City public school teachers, I would be able to tell you that there is no topic more important than education, and there is no job in America more important than the great work that our teachers do. The reality is that as the son of two retired city school teachers, my mom taught at Poly and Morgan State, my dad taught at Edmondson and Douglas, at Southern and Western, I learned firsthand the importance of education. I went from local public schools to Yale and Harvard Law School, and I came home to serve. The reality is that our schools in so many ways here in Baltimore are broken and we need dramatic changes. You're gonna hear me this evening talk about the importance of establishing community schools across our entire city, ensuring universal pre-K for every three and four year old with guaranteed transit from door to door, guaranteeing free college and trade school for graduates of Baltimore City public schools and making sure that we introduce mental health into every classroom and every school. And I'll have to stop you there, Thiru. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Wendy Bozell, and I have a unique position here as running for mayor, and my whole reason is because I am a teacher, I am in the trenches, and my mom is here. She has, was a teacher for 15 years at um, Baltimore City Schools, and my focus is, as a teacher, when I first walked into my classroom, I didn't have heat, no heat in my classroom. Everything I asked the principal for, books, my overhead's broken. The answer has always been no, it's not in the budget for 10 years. Our budget is $1.7 billion. There's no excuse for that. So I looked into it. Why am I not getting what I need from my students? Why am I freezing cold in my classroom? And why is there no air conditioning? And it happened hmm, about 16 years ago with Dr. Alonzo. He decided to give all the budgets to each principal. So 164 principals get 10 to $20 million, and you figure it out down the payroll. So that's why everything I ask, every time I ask for something, it's a big no for your students and for me. So my plan is, let's bring everything back. Let's bring that $1.7 billion and do it centrally. Thank let's you, Wendy. Make sure Thanks. that everything works. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Donna. <clears throat> Good evening, and thank you very much for inviting me, giving me this opportunity. What, my name is Don Scoggins. I'm a uh, Vietnam veteran, decorated Vietnam veteran. What I would like to do is have a very student-focused curriculum. I've talked to a lot of the young folks, and the reason why many of them are not performing well in school or even dropping out of school is because they're just not interested. I want us to have a more trade-based uh, curriculum. And I also want us to make sure that we open up these rec centers so the young people have something to do. And I would also emphasize having a internship type program whereby the young people, maybe starting at 16 years old, can have an internship in the local government so they can make some money. A lot of the young people I've talked to, you know, they want, you know, they want to be able to get to the position where they can make some money, make some dough, and that's what it's all about. That's what education is about, making it so that people can be productive citizens. And I'm not going to be, give a lot of platitudes and and do a lot of happy talk Thank you, that sir. doesn't produce anything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and good evening. Mm -hmm. I am a former teacher of Baltimore City Public Schools. I taught early childhood and I taught alternative ed. I also taught um, Head Start adults, parents, as well as I worked with alternative schools. Part of why I got into politics is because being a part of the Baltimore City Public Schools, and this is many of y'all where I'm born, 
showed me that if we didn't change policies, if we didn't change how we work with our education system, with our board, et cetera, that we were not going to progress. I'm a product of Baltimore City Public Schools. I went to one of the best high schools in this city, Northwestern High School. It hurts my heart to see the fact that now Baltimore City gets more money per pupil than it's ever gotten before, and that we're doing worse than what we've done in the past when we had 1,000 students who went to Northwestern when I attended um, Northwestern High School. Education is the key. Education is what's going to turn this city around. We keep talking about it. We keep making promises. But we haven't focused on our young people. Our young people, our babies, and our seniors and, our, and elderly individuals are the most important individuals in our city. Thank and you, Sheila. Thank you. All right. One minute. <laughs> All right. I told you. That's my job. I got you. All right. Our first question is going to come from Jason Rose. So Jason, what would you like to know? And again, we'll, we'll answer in the order in which you're seated. What is your opinion of current spending on public education funds, specifically in Baltimore City Public Schools? If you guys don't mind, I will stand now that others have. Um, look, Sheila's right. We have the third highest per pupil expenditure in the country. We also have some of the most profound challenges facing any school system in America. Our chronic absenteeism is 54%. It is the highest among any in the nation. We have high school dropout rates. We have a shrinking population. So the reality is that though it's easy to say a lot of money is going in, we have a really big challenge. I want to make sure that the money is being spent on specific challenges that have remained for a generation. When our former mayor got $641 million in ARPA funds, you might have thought that some of that money would go to making sure that heat and air conditioning was dedicated to every school. Yet every school year, at the beginning, you see stories on the news outlets about how kids have to go home or not come to school at all because it's too hot and there's no air conditioning. Every winter, we hear that there are schools that don't have heat, and so we see these photos of children shivering in their coats. We do need more money in our schools, given the challenges, but I want to devote them to very specific purposes. So when I go ask the federal government for injection of funds, when I ask the state legislature for an injection of funds, we have a $1.7 billion budget. 35% of that comes from the city. We know that there are specific things to which I would devote it. Number one, making sure that there is transit for every three and four year old to get to this universal pre-K. Every study in America tells you that that is the most important investment we can make, and yet right now, a fraction of the children are able to do that. Those are the kinds of investments we have to make. They have to be bold, they have to be expansive, they have to be things that we've never done before. But asking for more additional money and not changing how you're fundamentally doing things, that's not gonna cut it for this generation or the next. Like Fru said, we have $1.7 billion to work with with our schools, and I want to make sure that every school is a great choice, that you don't have to take transportation from one end of the city to the other on the chance that you got a good school choice. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we have the prison to pipeline, where we, in third grade, they're going to test students, and they decide how many prisons or how many prisons we need based on how students are doing in the reading test on third grade. Well, that's backwards. So what we need to do is we need to right, have a universal pre-K. Let's start there. But then also, we need to have two teachers in every classroom from kindergarten to second grade. And then we're going to test the kids in second grade. And if they are not passing in reading and math, then we're going to have intensive summer school program. I don't want any kid starting third grade not be able to read and not be able to write. We're going to put everything in place there. Because if kids can read in third grade, then they're not going to be going to prison. And we won't have to build any more prisons, so we, have to, we can reduce our costs that we're spending on prisons. It's a shame that I had to learn. I went to Coppin for my master's in education, and that's what I had to learn. Oh yeah, we base our prisons on the third grade reading test. So that has to end. 
And also, we need to work on the 58% of the students that are absent. I am a hospital teacher now. So we had 122 students that were shot non-fatally. And then we had about 20 that died. And I have these pieces that I have to pick up. So I go into this hospital room, I try to get myself together, know this kid now is paralyzed, and school is really what's gonna make, education is gonna make a difference in this child's life. Then I pull their school records. Every one of the students that I've taught was two years behind that had been shot and paralyzed. And they had missed 50 to 100 days of school. So if someone was checking on these kids day four like they're supposed to, and we're following the truancy laws that we have here in Maryland. Thank you, Wendy. We Thank wouldn't you. have been shot and we wouldn't have been paralyzed. <laughs> in addition to what everyone else said, no need to repeat and everything. What I would do is work, with the, work more with the families. A lot of the students that are not being properly educated or are not being educated, we have to look at the family. Why, why aren't they interested in school? What are their situations at home? We, we know that a lot of the crime that is committed comes from young people and they have challenges at home, so we need to bring the folk, when we talk about education, it's more than just the student, it's also the family. So I would like to bring families more into the mix when it comes to educating the students and with all the money that's being spent that doesn't go to what we think it should go towards, there is enough money, I think there is enough money there to at least start bringing the family together and deal with the schools. That's what I'm gonna do, thank you. <laughs> the mayor appoints seven of the nine school board members. And when you hear an administration say that they're not responsible for the school, that's false information. Seven of the nine school board members are appointed by the mayor. Those seven individuals, along with the two elected, are the board of, they are the board that controls the CEO all the way down. I don't know about any of you, but I don't even know who the school board members are. They're not vocal, they're not involved, and they're not transparent in what they're doing to build a better school. Accountability, accountability is needed more than ever. We can talk about more money, we can talk about creating another lottery, we can talk about creating gambling, which gambling was supposed to go to money, but we need to make sure that each of our schools have equal programs, some people don't necessarily want to hear this. I believe we need to extend the school day because some of our young people need that extracurriculum act for to learn and also for extracurriculum activities that now young people don't get, art, reading, physical ed. All of those are part of the development of the child. And then the family, parents and guardians, if we have an extended school day, they can come in and take advantage of opportunities within the building. I believe in the community school concept where you identify the needs of that school and the young people and the families that are in that community, and you bring those resources into the school. You bring mental health services. You bring the needs of those programs. I'm currently working with a school in Baltimore City, and, there, and we have a former police officer who heads up our truancy program. He is in that school visiting those families, finding out what the needs are. We need to have that across the board in Baltimore City Public Schools. It's unheard of based on the money, and I keep going back to accountability. We have to expose our young, pe young people early on about the opportunities. I did the last graduation at Northwestern High School. I stopped a young man because he had a shirt and tie on. I said, what are your plans? He had no plans. He graduated from the 12th grade with no plan of action. When you come into ninth grade, you should have an idea of what you want to do Thank you. when you graduate. And you need to get exposed to the Thank various you, industries to help you to determine your destination. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. All right, our next uh, question will come from Erin. What are your thoughts on the national teacher shortage crisis and how should Baltimore City Public Schools address the shortage? Not only the shortage, but the retention of teachers that are already in the system. The room? Oh, I'm in the hot seat tonight, okay. Um, look, this is a national crisis, but is it a particularly acute crisis in Baltimore? What Wendy proposed, having two teachers in every classroom, that would be incredible, but right now, we can't get one teacher in every classroom. 
So one of the things that we have to do is understand that it is harder today to recruit and retain teachers in Baltimore City than perhaps anywhere. Part of it is that we have lots of uncertainty. As the folks from the Baltimore Teacher Network know, there are negotiations about how teachers are going to be paid in the days ahead. There are, dis uh, there are differences between how folks in the county and how folks in the city are paid. There are jurisdictions where you get bonuses for masters and there are not bonuses for others. Those kinds of things have to be ironed out. But we have to be more specific than that. We should establish very specific incentives for teachers to teach in this jurisdiction. We should offer them retention bonuses and starting bonuses, just like the corporate sector does, to come teach in the hardest school system, certainly in the state of Maryland, perhaps anywhere in the country. We should also, and this is going to be controversial, encourage teachers with incentives to teach at the hardest schools. We have some incredible schools in Baltimore, City, Poly, School for the Arts, but we also have some profoundly broken schools, Dunbar and Douglas and Edmondson. My dad taught in a lot of those schools, but he was paid the same as if he was in a school with dramatically better results and dramatically better uh, student cohorts. That has got to change. It is hard to be a teacher in the city. When my dad retired, he was the oldest teacher teaching in the state of Maryland. He was 80 years old. He loved teaching. He's 87 now, and if we would, if, if we would let him, he'd still be out there teaching. But that is not the teachers of today, and you can't blame them. The salary is uncertain, the challenges are profound, and we don't treat teachers like the backbone of our society, which is what they are. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> As a teacher, it is frustrating about our salary and what we're going to make and, you know, things like that. But the main thing that teachers complain about is the amount of paperwork they have to do and the amount of time they, they don't get for their planning and how they have to give it up, their time to teach in another classroom or if another teacher doesn't show up. So we need to work on that and give teachers time so that they can get their work done and reduce some of the paperwork they have to do. But the main thing is recruiting more teachers and have a great plan for that. When I was at Coppin University, a lot of teachers would try to find their new position, what they're going to get when they graduate. We should be coming in to our local colleges and making a good package for them. First, will say that we will forgive your debt if you agree to teach five years at a Baltimore City school. Also, some... It's <laughs> a good idea. <laughs> some districts have done this, where, you know, we have a lot of vacant schools. So they've turned them into apartments and little condos for their teachers that they can live there. And when you graduate from college, if you are offered no you have to pay back your debt, and then you have a place to live, then you're going to take that position. And these are teachers that we can recruit that are right here. So I feel like that will really work for our teachers. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Donald. What I would do is be a little more innovative and make it so that people who want to teach, you would say it could be a second career, someone who's retired, and they have a lot of life experiences, and they really want to teach young people because some people go into teaching because that's the only job they can get. But many people who may have been, who may have worked for maybe 25 or 30 years and they have a lot of life experiences, maybe they would like to come in and teach. And I think that we can look at teachers as maybe working, uh, have part-time teachers so that someone who's retired and they, you know, want to have a, a, you know, have less I would say they want to have something else to do, let them be able to teach maybe uh, one or two days a week. And we have to look at the certifications. That's sometimes the teachers union or maybe the union in general, or the certification requirements can be somewhat onerous and some people may not want to deal with all that. You know, and I think um, someone said about the bureaucracy, teachers don't want to come in and wind up being bureaucrats. Because I'm not a bureaucrat, I don't like bureaucracy. So we need to make it so the teaching be more innovative, more interesting, and maybe not 
so uh, restrictive in terms of what you have to do. I would like to see teachers almost be like small business people where you come in maybe a few hours a week or a few hours a day, do your good teaching, and then you can go off and, and make some money doing some other things. You know? So I think we had to be a little more innovative in, 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 doing, uh, in attracting people because it, there's a lot of talent out there, but they may not have the, the so-called uh, degrees and the certificates and things, but we need to do something to make it a little more inter interesting to people. Thank you. Do anybody want to protect them? Excuse me, sir, we're going to stay, keep our focus on the stage, but you can ask that question when we get to audience questions. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, that was part of my comment that I was going to make. First of all, our schools have to be safe mm -hmm. for teachers, for administrators, and for students. Mm -hmm. That's first and foremost. Baltimore City Public Schools are not safe for anybody. Respect. Teachers are a noble profession. It's a mission when you decide to become a teacher. When I became a teacher, it was a mission that I wanted to make an impact on a young person's life. And we have to get back, you know, a lot of people say like, you don't want to go back to the old ways, but there are a lot of old ways and old beliefs and philosophies that we have to get back to. Teachers were respected. Teachers today are not respected. And so I always use a comparison. Football players, back basketball players make millions of dollars. Teachers mold young people's lives. And so we need to make sure that they are respected and treated just the same as a football player. Maybe not paying a million dollars, maybe not paying a football player a million dollars, but it should be comparable across the board. We also have to work with our universities and our colleges, but again, exposure early on when young people are in school to show them, not only in teaching, but in nursing, in public safety, in fire, it's a shortage across the board. And salaries is one issue, but there are a whole host of other issues that we have to get back to, some basic fundamental things, mm -hmm. and that's safe schools, respect for teachers, um, discipline in our schools. We have to have families working with our schools in partnership, salaries for our teachers, paperwork. I remember mm -hmm. many years ago, the paperwork, I don't know if you're ever gonna get rid of it, but I figured today, since now we have computers and software that it should be easier. But we need to make sure that we are talking to teachers and administrators to make sure that individuals who are getting into that profession, that we not only hear them, but that we, we work with them to meet what those goals are. Because it's not always about money. It's about other areas as well, and that they have an environment that is clean, and that we don't have lead and water in our schools. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. And I'm going to pick up on, on what you just said, because it's my turn to ask a question of what you're all talking about. I interviewed an acting school superintendent in the city school system at one point a number of years ago. And it was about safety in the schools. And she said to me, and I'll never forget it, if you want to solve the problem of crime in the schools, solve poverty. Mm -hmm. Because there are kids who go home and they don't have electricity, et cetera. So let's tackle that. We know about poverty in this city, and yet the kids, we've got to get them to school. What do we do, since poverty is the problem, how do we then give kids a good education? Mm -hmm. um, education is connected to every issue. It is literally at the center of poverty and crime and jobs and society. Um, the reality is that we have to do dramatic things to improve the disinvested neighborhoods that have been that way for a generation or more. Poverty is confined to certain pockets, but it affects all of us. We need to make sure that these kids are getting an education that can put them on a track to get out of poverty. Now notice that they have to get to the school first, which is one of the reasons why this chronic absenteeism problem is such a profound one. It used to be in the 30s and 40% uh, just a few years ago, and that was already the highest in the region. Now it is over 50%. That is people that are not coming to school. And you're right, we can have a person going home and checking in on them and encouraging their parents to bring them, but the reality is that in other school districts, we go pick the kids up where they are. We don't expect their parents that are juggling and struggling to try to find a way there. We don't expect them to get on an unreliable bub public transit system and take the MTA bus to get to school. That is one of the problems. But the other problem, Denise, 
is we have to put them on a track where they're doing the kinds of works that can lift their families out of poverty. Not every kid needs to go to college. Some of these kids want to work with their hands. They want to become plumbers and carpenters. They want to go to Lincoln Tech and, and other trade schools to get the kinds of skills that can lift their families out. We've got to get the kids to the school, and then we've got to teach them the skills, everything from financial literacy to trades, to make sure they can live the kind of life that we dream for them. Um, Frederick Douglass once said, it is easier to raise strong children than to repair broken men. He said it in 1855. It is as true today as it was at the time of the Civil War. All of these problems are connected, and we've got to lift all boats up. Thank you. Well, we have 58% of our students that are chronically absent. And that is the big problem. And you're right, it's, it does connect with poverty. So what the first thing we have to do is we have to bring back the truant officers. And what the truant officers do is they go and they visit the home and they talk to the family and find out what are the issues and why your student isn't going to school. And some of them are simple. Poverty is an issue. And one student I was working with, we didn't have a truant officer, so I said, why are you not coming to school? And she said, because her family didn't have a washer and dryer and she only had one uniform. So once the uniform was dirty, she didn't want to come to school. So I took her and we went and we bought, I bought her a couple of pants and you know, a couple of shirts so that that wouldn't be a problem for her that she could come to school. But that's something that we can address when we have truant officers because we have a lot of money available to support these families. One child that I work with, I was like, why aren't you coming to school? And he's like, I'm just so tired in the morning because I have to work late at night to make extra money for my family so they can have food and pay the rent. And so if we know that's an issue, then we can help that family. And so they won't have to be working at night and be so tired that they can't go to work the next day. And another issue um, with truancy is the basic fact that a lot of parents don't understand that it's against the law to not have your kids go to school. So they're not looking for any resources or anything to help them because they don't think it's, it's that much of a problem. So what we need to do is educate the public, follow the truancy laws. And the truancy law says that if you are absent after three days and you don't call the school, then you're gonna get fined $50 a day. The second offense, it's $100 a day. And the third offense, you have to go in front of a judge. But we don't want to um, find parents, but we just want to make sure that they know it's just so important that there's laws in the book. Thank you, you, Wendy. No, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I think that we need to be uh, more innovative. Who says that kids necessarily have to go to school every day? Maybe they can go Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We need, everything else is changing in the world with the internet and all. I think that a lot of the young people who are, who are, are, very, are very innovative, they have a, they're very bright. I would recommend, if, I, if it was up to me, I would have kids coming to school maybe, uh, maybe three days a week. And they can use the other days to maybe do more of their homework. Or maybe they, if they have a part-time job. But young people are just like adults. They have stress stresses and strains too, so let not give them a lot of stress where they have to just come to class every day. That's what I would recommend, and that's very simple. I don't have to give you a long thesis type dissertation or explanation about it, but that's what I would look at. I would look at our curriculum. We need to be a little more innovative and not stick all the kids into what was being done maybe the last 40 or 50 years. Thank you. You know, you said poverty, right? Yeah. Sorry? You said poverty. What are we going to do about poverty? Poverty. How, they're connected. Yes, yeah. they are connected. And a, a couple of thoughts, and, uh, and I'm going to be brief, that I have is we have a nonprofit organization in the city called Healthy Start, and it deals with women and families when that baby is born. And that's an opportunity to begin to not only track that baby, but also work with that family. Because 
the way you get out of poverty is through education. Doesn't matter if you're going to college or if you're going to professions, but something has happened where we lost education as being that priority in the family. You know, why is it that everyone else tends to do well when they come here to this country? Because they make education a priority. And we have to get back to some basic fundamental things to show, yeah, sure, we can do some alternative things. I taught alternative ed, where young people had intensive mental health. These were kids who couldn't make it into regular public schools. They had intensive mental health services. I taught pre-GED, and they also worked. Some of those young people to this day, they're adults now, are retiring from the jobs they had back when I was teaching. And so in high school, it might be a matter of creating internships for our young people. In elementary school and, and, and Head Start, it's working with those parents, mm -hmm. looking at the opportunity. There's so many training programs and opportunities now for families to be able to get out of poverty. We have to begin to break cycles, and we have to really call people out to share with them what the opportunities are. Today I had an opportunity to visit um, Rosemount Towers, and it's for us elderly and disabled. And the number of young disabled individuals that were in that building, the first question I ask is, even though you're disabled, I ask always, do you have children? What it, what's your involvement in the school with your child? Do you have the time? Have you taken the time? Go back to community schools. Wendy mentioned about the child not having a wash machine to wash their uniform. Some of our community schools have a laundry room based on the needs of the kids and the families in that school where they partner. They have a pantry to help take home food if they don't have anything to eat. But the school is the center of our communities, and we need to build more on those and those Thank partners. Thank you, Sheila. Your turn. This question is very important with me because uh, when I started, I was actually started at a charter school. So what is your stance on charter schools in Baltimore City, and how do you see their role evolve in the public education system? Um, I sit on the board of the Baltimore Curriculum Project, which is one of the charter school operators here in Baltimore City. The reality, school that is, the reality is that, like general public schools, public charter schools are uneven. Some of them are terrific. They're doing really well. Uh, some of the very best schools in Baltimore are public charter schools. Some of them are not. And the reality is that we need to have opportunity to grow our public school network. I do believe in that. I do think that there is room for growth of public charter schools. We need to make sure that there's sufficient oversight of those public charter schools. Hampstead Hill Elementary is one of the top performing elementary schools in Baltimore City. A few years ago, the federal government required uh, every state to grade their public schools one to five or A to F. Um, there were a, hundreds of five-star schools all across the state of Maryland. In Baltimore City, there were only three. Poly, BSA, Baltimore School for the Hearts, and Hampstead Hill Elementary School. Now that was partly because that public charter school had great leadership and great parents and a great cohesive theory on what they were trying to do. But my public charter school operator also operates Frederick Elementary and Govins Elementary. And they're doing well, but not as well as Hampstead Hill. So I don't want to think that public charter schools are a panacea. They're not. It's complicated. But I really do think that opening the doors for innovation, so you have public charter schools that, for, for example, provide uh, uh, longer school days, school uh, instruction around uh, the summer, having opportunities to have a public charter school that is devoted to trade, that is devoted to things that might be of interest to certain communities. That is the kind of innovation that we need in our public school system. Um, I have uh, proposed that Baltimore City become the second city in America after Indianapolis that has mayoral charter schools. Right now, the authority to grant a charter is vested exclusively in the school board. And yes, the mayor appoints them, but doesn't have the power to fire them on day one. And I don't really want to blame the school board for what's going on. I want to make sure the mayor can take responsibility for the growth and expansion of public charter schools, too. Thank you.
Well, some of the charters, public charter schools are good, but I just want to make sure that every school in Baltimore City is good, 164 schools. So I think we can learn from some of the charter schools and we should analyze them, but the main thing is I want to make sure that the money is spent equally within every school. And the resources that some charter schools get are a lot bigger because they have the ability to get out and get funding from other sources and they have more staff that are able to do that. But we should do that across all of the schools in Baltimore City. We should make every school like a charter school and look how charter schools are run and let's do it across the whole 164 schools and let's make sure that every school in Baltimore City is a good choice for our students. And that's what we need to work, and that's what we need to overcome, not have charter, non-charter. We need to make sure every school in Baltimore City is run well. Thank you. I'm a, big, I'm a big fan of having limited government. And what I would recommend is breaking up the educational monopoly as best possible, because I think that one of the problems that you talked about with education and even with poverty, is that we apply a one-size-fits-all type of situation. Some people can do one thing and another person can, can do something else. I think that we should be a little more innovative and we keep, I've been hearing for about 20 or 30 years, they've been talking about having more trades and, and different things, but you can do the talk, but if you don't actually take action on it, then it, do, it doesn't mean anything. We'll be here maybe three or four years from now, I'll be t you'll be having the same, talking the same thing, so we need to, do some follow-up and not have a lot of pretty tight talk, but do the work. I'm not a talker, all right? You probably know that. I'm not a talker. I'd rather get in the trenches and go and see the, see the things that are being done. So that's what I would recommend. We just need to get off our duffs and do the work and be more interactive with the young people, find out what they want to do. The young people out there, they know more than what the adults know. So some of the young people may, like I said, go to school maybe three days a week. And they can do, have other days to do certain other things. Now, right quick, when it comes to poverty, I think that we should look at maybe breaking up the government in such a way that we can have shared jobs. People work, what, 40 hours a week? That's what it's supposed to be? Maybe they can work less than 40 hours a week and take that time and give to some other folks who could do the work, especially entry level type jobs, and that can improve the, uh, improve the poverty rate. We just need to be innovative and, and just not try to have a bureaucracy that's, because I think we're, we're drowning in bureaucracy. That's, all, that's the only thing I can see. I see we got too much regulation, too much bureaucracy, and no outcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Sheila. I support charter schools mm -hmm. and I also support right. regular public schools. I think there's a balance. And as mayor, I actually opened up or helped open up the Montessori school that's on Guilford, which is a very successful elementary middle um, school. And I think what we need to do is work closely with the communities and take some of the best practices from our charter schools and implement them into our regular public schools. And part of why charter schools are so successful is because they create partnerships. We have a lot of Baltimoreans that went from elementary to high school. Nobody asks what college you go to. They always ask what high school. There's a lot of alumni. Poly City, Western has very strong alumni associations. Some of the other ones. But we need to build on that because many people with it, who have graduated from many of our public schools have great careers and great experiences. But we haven't built on in strengthening our alumni to come back and work with our schools. And I think that could help significantly. I do support charter schools. I think in Baltimore City, some of the criteria where some schools were eliminated as a result of uh, politics is unfortunate, particularly one of the boys' schools that was created. Um, that I think should be open, but, but I, I think it's a balance, and I think we can learn from some of our successful charter schools. Okay. Be 
based on I've, we've heard a lot about what we need to change and what we need to do better, what do you see as strengths in Baltimore City, both as a systemic support of our communities, but also as educational systems? Um, this is one where I wish I didn't have to answer first, uh, because it is hard to identify things that are promising. Our teachers are working so hard. Our superintendent and our school board members and our principals, they are working hard. But, and there are bright spots. Baltimore School for the Arts is one of the finest institutions in the nation. We have a handful of terrific elementary schools, largely in very affluent neighborhoods like Guilford and Patterson Park. Um, we do have extraordinary traditions and stories that will be remembered forever. The five uh, rock star basketball players at Dunbar in 1980 and 1981. Thurgood Marshall graduating from Frederick Douglass High School, going and becoming the first black Supreme Court justice. But those are not the stories we tell anymore. And it is hard for me to want to condemn and criticize a system that gave my family a chance. My mom and dad couldn't have found other jobs in this country. It was my mom who started at Poly, my dad started at Edmondson, that gave us a chance to have a livelihood. It was the teachers union that protected their jobs in so many places and in so many ways. But the system that created Frederick Douglass, I mean, sorry, that created Thurgood Marshall, the system that my mother started teaching in in 1970 and my father started teaching in in 1980 is dramatically smaller. Our facilities are twice as old in Baltimore City as any jurisdiction in the state of Maryland. There is still lead in the pipes so you can't drink water from the water fountain. There are still schools that don't have heat and air conditioning today. That is a problem. And as much as I want to celebrate the handful of bright spots in Baltimore, to pretend that every school tomorrow can be Poly or School for the Arts or Hampstead Hill or Guilford Montessori, that is not reality. And I do think it's important to be clear that some of the things we're talking about cannot be on the table. We cannot centralize government and not allow principals to have a lot of Thank say you, about sir. what happens in their schools. Thank you. Well, I try to look at the data and see what is doing good in Baltimore City Schools. And one thing it is a little bright spot is they've been putting more efforts into younger learners. So we did get an increase in the reading levels for pre-K and kindergartners. So I was excited to read that. But then I have to get back to another thing that's really pretty great is Baltimore City is one of the only districts that really take it seriously what happens to kids when they have to go to the hospital and so they have a whole division which I'm part of that is home and hospital and we go out into the community we go to people's homes and we also go to the hospitals and we make sure that these students are not missing months of school and so that then when they are ready to go back to school that then they're able to so I really like that that's a bright spot and I hear maybe that might be cut so I'm hoping that that does stay and that we still keep having home and hospital but then I have to get back to the problem of 164 principals having total control of their budgets they don't want that they maybe had two weeks training in budgeting if these principals were allowed to do their job they could go out be there in the morning shake people's hands um, learn about the students, meet with the parents. If kids aren't going to school, they could make those phone calls. They could be going out to the community and really building a relationship. I, when I worked at Sinclair Lane Elementary School, I, my job was to try to make sure we could get kids to come back to school. So I made a relationship with the Giant, the Dunkin' Donuts, the Pizza Pizza, and we had prizes for the students. And then we also got the parents more involved too and instead of having the back to school nights and meetings with parents in the evenings when they were bringing their kids in I would say come on I have donuts and coffee and the parents would come in and then they would be part of the school and we'd sign them up there to be like a room mother so we have to be innovative and using ways to bring the schools together and let's get the budget Thank away you. from the principal thank to you run. Thank you.
repeat that question again right quick. What you see what's now? working in the public schools? Oh. What can you credit the schools with? What would you build on that's working right now in the public as mayor? Schools. Let me see, what would I build? What would I? Hmm. That's, that's a question I would really have to ask other people, what is working? We hear so many things about what's not working. I'm just being facetious. What I would do is, I would say that what's working is that many people do want to have a change. And we need to, we need to uh, build on that attitude for change, and I think that's the best thing, you know, because it hasn't been, admittedly, and no need in just standing up here and giving a lot of uh, pretty type and happy talk, we know there's a problem in the Baltimore school system. And I think that the, um, many people just don't know how to go about doing it, and I think somebody needs to come in with some backbone who's not entrenched, who's not part of the system, so to speak, to do what's necessary to be done. And I think that dealing with the what's the advantage is that we have a lot of young people who really want to be in the trades. So I think we need to do, we need to do that, and I think that's something that the school system is uh, primed for. I think the school system is primed for change despite all the uh, the uh, impediments that have been out there. So I do think that's a good, a good thing, that they do want to change. It's just a matter of being able to change and not having people who are putting roadblocks in their way, because there are a lot of roadblocks put in the way of uh, making the change that's necessary. Thank you. OK. OK. Huh? One, we've been able to build new schools, finally, after a long period of time when we didn't have the revenue. Two, we have one of the top robotics program within the state of Maryland competing against private schools. Um, we have some of the best choirs within Baltimore City schools that have now been able to travel to compete in Florida and other places and expose young people who have never had the opportunity to fly to do that. Um, of course, we have um, people that, teachers, administrators that are committed no matter what the circumstances are. They look at the glasses being half full and knowing that every day it's a new beginning because I speak with teachers and administrators. Um, we also have um, parents that are engaged and involved and guardians that are engaged and involved in many of our schools in Baltimore City that sometimes is not noted because when you listen to the news, you hear more negative than you do positive. Um, and last but not least, um, I think that, you know, one of, the, one of the probably also another positive is that we have individuals' partnerships with nonprofits and, and the private sector who have now come in and really have gotten engaged and involved in many of our schools in Baltimore City. All right, so it's my turn. We had a lot of questions from the audience on one subject. So let's really get nitty gritty here. These people are asking, what are we going to do about harassment and bullying? How are we going to make sure kids, with the rise of violence in schools all across the US, how are we going to handle the uh, unsafe the teaching situation? Gun violence, number one cause of death in young people, we know that. I mean, let's talk real practicality here. Do you have scans on entranceways to school? Do you arm city police, uh, school police officers? What kinds of things do you do when you're facing a situation in which a lot of parents feel unsafe sending their children to school? Um, the violence that we're seeing in our schools is violence that is seeping into our schools from the streets. Um, I don't want our schools to feel and look like prisons or military facilities. I don't want kids to walk in worrying about that. There have to be and there are better ways to do this. Um, the reality is that you take a risk when you introduce more guns into schools that something goes terribly wrong. Of course we have to protect our schools from the devastating violence that we have seen nationwide. But the overwhelming source of those challenges has always been in every city, in every uh, state, in every mass shooting, a mental health challenge as much as it is an access to guns problem. 
So be clear, we do need to wrestle with both of those problems. But the challenge with our children today when it comes to violence is that they are both the victims and the perpetrators of these crimes. They are growing up in a culture where there are no consequences for certain kinds of conduct and not the kind of support and services for other things. The most difficult feature of juvenile justice is distinguishing between that first time offender who knows that there's an opportunity for them and that needs support and services and that repeat violent offender that needs to be taught that there are consequences for their crimes. And that conduct that is happening on the streets is coming to school. I represent the family of Dante Dorsey, a 16-year-old boy who was killed outside of Edmondson High School uh, last January. It was the third murder of the year, the second juvenile murder of that year. It happened in the first seven days of January. Um, he was having lunch across the street with friends, and kids in that neighborhood were all hanging out at the Edmondson Village Shopping Center. He was gunned down along with four other kids that were shot. One of them has been arrested. It was a juvenile. That is a mass shooting in any other city in America. In Baltimore, it's just another day across from Edmondson Village Shopping Center. That has got to end. Yeah. I have a unique perspective because I actually work with the students that are victims of gun violence. So when I walk into, the into their rooms, because they can't get out of their beds because they're paralyzed, I talk to them and a lot of them have, because they weren't in school, and the truancy rate of 50% is what's causing a lot of the violence that we're seeing. Kids not at school. And they're out there and they're committing violent crimes and shootings. And what needs to be done is we need to, as I said before, we need to have the truant officers back to make sure that kids are going to school. Because every kid that I taught that was shot and paralyzed had been absent 50 to 100 days. They weren't going to school. They were two years behind the school. They were kind of like pushed through. So in order to make a difference for our schools, we need to make sure that the kids are coming to school. Because if someone would have checked on my students that I teach after three days, on the fourth day, if they were checking on this kid, I'm sure that all the kids that I work with that are now paralyzed, they wouldn't have been because they would have been in school. And then we need to open up the police athletic leagues again. We had 64 police athletic centers, the PAL program. And the youth violence was the lowest that it ever had been when the kids had somewhere to go from 4 o'clock to 8 p.m. and then a place to go during the um, summer. They had activities, it's true. And also, what was a great benefit is when we had the PAL program is that the students had, there was the most youth that were in the police academy. That we didn't have a problem with having, like we have now, 700 police officers down. And if you ask any of the police officers now, they will say, I got my start at the PAL program and that's why I'm an officer now. So we need to get that mentorship going again and then have partnerships with the police and the youth and then Thank we'll you, see ben. crime going down. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. In addition to uh, making sure that these rec centers are open back up so the young people have something to do, I will say this, I am in favor of resource officers having, uh, having a weapon inside the school. A lot of people don't want to have weapons in and they, they may have an issue with that, but a lot of the young kids who do have weapons, I mean, you know, let's, you know we, don't want the, we don't want the officers to have the weapons, but yet, who says that we can keep the young people that may be uh, perpetrating these crimes from having weapons? I mean, they are not thinking about it, but yet we have to think about not having it. So I think that we need to be very firm in that regard, because that'd be a deterrent. Number two is what I said earlier about not necessarily having youth going to school every day. I mean, of course you have to come up with the curriculum that makes it applicable, but I think that young people should 
be able to maybe not go to school every day and maybe they can go to work. Maybe at 16, what, 16, 17 years old, be, have a part-time job working in the, uh, have an internship. Some people may not like that, but, but going to school every day doesn't necessarily mean the kids are learning. So you can have them going to school, maybe extended, extended days, and then some days they can have off. I, I believe in that. I believe we need to be innovative. The kids are bored. I know that, so we need to do, find out what we can do to get their interest. Some of these young people, I don't know if they've done this or not, but the kids that are uh, committing these violent crimes, talk to them, ask them what do they, you know, what do they want to do or what could we, we need to start engaging the young people more instead of just talking about them all the time. We need to engage them and find out what we can do to get their interest. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Um, I agree that we should not create prisons within our school, but we have to make sure that our young people who will want to be in school are being safe in school. And so whatever it takes, we have to do that. Because the majority of our kids that are in school want to be safe. When it comes to bullying, we cannot just brush it under the table. We have to make sure that the administrators of that school or get right on top of it with the guardians or parents, with both families, sit down if it means it needs some kind of support services, but you can't brush it under the table and ignore it. Because what happened at Carver could have been avoided if somebody had addressed that issue early on with bullying a child. And we really need to get and deal with this early on with our young people. Our police officers, our school police officers, Need to, we, first of all, we have a shortage of school police officers, yep. but they need to be visible out in the community around the schools in those communities. That young lady walking to school, Tiger Parkway to Gwens Falls, going to the con connections, that should have not happened if we would have had copping police who might have been patrolling the area, because the vis visibility of individuals who are public safety will give people a second thought about committing a crime and doing something. Maybe. Our school police, our police officers, now they're on Gwens Falls Parkway in the cars. They're not out walking around with School 60 and, 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 and connect. I still call it Lamel because, you know, that's what it was called. They're, you walk the beat. You, you, you make yourself visible so our young people can stay safe. I work with companies in the construction industry, and I met a company who has a system that can pick up on weapons, even if it's a ghost gun. And it was brought into Baltimore City to test it, as well as another county. The county that it was tested in, several counties had this equipment. Baltimore City, to this day, is dragging their feet. And it's something that could work so that we can make sure that when kids come into that school who want to learn, that they're able to do that. That's I want to apologize that I have to leave because I had another commitment, but I did invite Yolanda Pullian up to take my seat since she was part of the panel or the list of um, individuals, so I don't know if that can happen. But I, I have another commitment that I need to go to, so I, I want to apologize and not about not staying. All right, you'll Thank have you. to unhook your mic. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Before you do this follow-up question, we have a follow-up question, which is good, because this is an important issue and obviously important to so many of you in the audience. We have Crystal Gonzalez is here with us this evening. Are you here, Crystal? I met, hi, I met you earlier when we did another town hall. I remember meeting you very well. Mrs. Gonzalez is the mother of 18-year-old Alia Gonzalez, who lost her life at a block party that we all know took place in Brooklyn. Baltimore City neighborhood in July of 2023, the worst mass shooting in the history of our city. Aaliyah had recently graduated high school. She was looking forward to attending college. I can see her picture in my mind as I say her name. Mrs. Gonzalez has spent a great amount of her time working with local and government leaders to address the crisis among Baltimore City youth as an effort to prevent more parents from having to endure the pain she is faced with every day from losing her daughter, who has such a bright, extraordinary future ahead of her. Thank you for joining us tonight, and I know you were concerned about safety, and we have a follow-up question on that. Go right ahead. <clears throat> You've talked a lot about the, uh, the schools here in Baltimore City and about what they need, but have, have you actually went into the school 
in the last couple years and actually talk to the students and see what they need and see what they want, talk to the teachers, see what they need, see what they want. And what was your experience like when you were in those schools? Um, it's a really important question. Thank you again, by the way, Ms. Gonzalez, for being here. Um, I uh, helped coach debate at Frederick Douglass High School for years. And it happened soon after I read an article in the Baltimore Sun after Freddie Gray happened. The teachers lamented in the local newspapers that in the immediate wake of what happened, everybody came to the school uh, and everybody wanted to help. And then soon thereafter, everybody disappeared. And a teacher was complaining about that. I wasn't in public office. I was in government, but wasn't running for office. And I reached out to the teacher and said, how can I help? Um, and I said, I used to be a debater. I used to stand on uh, stages and argue with people. I, I can try and come and help. And once every two weeks, I would go in and try to do a little bit of something. And I'll tell you something. The teachers appreciated it because of what Wendy said. It was nice to have a minute to breathe to not have to be on your best every moment, to be able to take a break to go to the restroom. One of the best investments we can make is to have not necessarily a second teacher, but just a second adult, an adult volunteer, a, a college kid who's doing an internship in that classroom. That's what I saw from the teachers. There's a number of teachers here that I talked to, that I asked what they were experiencing before I came tonight. Um, they're my friends. Uh, they're my fathers. They're my father's friends. Um, but I also saw in those kids something that broke my heart. Um, I was trying to teach them rhetoric and how to stand up and make an argument. And I saw all these kids break up into their groups. And these were 11th and 12th graders at Frederick Douglass High School. And they would talk about some big issue, guns in the school resource officer's hands, for example. And then they would get up there and they would take their notes and they would struggle to read the words they had written. These were 11th and 12th graders in the debate program at the school that created Thurgood Marshall. It broke my heart, and I did my best, um, but I do try to spend a ton of time there. I was at Leap Rock Elementary School with a lot of people just a few weeks ago for the Read Across America. I read people the Lorax. Thank you. <laughs> Wendy. Okay. Well, that's an interesting question since I'm every day with teachers in, every, in a couple different schools. So I'm at Kip Academy, Walbrook Junction area, so I meet a lot of teachers there. And one of the things that I hear all the time is that they never can get the things that they need. And they talk to their principals and it's not in the budget. So this is a big problem for a lot of teachers here in Baltimore City. When I was a substitute teacher working my master's at Coppin, I worked at many different Baltimore City, I mean Baltimore County schools substitute teaching. I needed books or paper or supplies and I would call a different department. If I needed books, I called the literacy department. If I called, if I needed math manipulatives, I called the math department. If my computer didn't work, I called IT and got a new one if it was broken. In Baltimore City, let's see, my overhead was broken, so I asked the principal for, you know, are we going to get it fixed? And she said, no, it's not in the budget. So I had to buy my own overhead. Uh, let's see, I wanted to be able to buy some new books, get some new books for my students, and I was told it's not in the budget. So that's one issue, is we need to make sure that teachers' needs are met for their books, supplies, their classroom, and their laptops. My laptop was 25 years old, and I was told, oh, I guess you have to buy your own. That shouldn't be how we treat our teachers, so I hear that a lot. Also, one thing that um, com comes up a lot is we have to give up our planning time because the teacher is out, so we have to teach during their time. So that's something that we need to address, ways to help teachers when they don't have their planning times, that we need to, I guess, hire more people for our school system. Thanks. Question again. He, he wants to know, have you been in a classroom recently? Have you experienced what the teachers and the students are actually having to deal with every day? In particular, regarding safety as well. Right. 
Well, in terms of safety, uh, not that, because the school I visited, <coughs> I went and helped. Uh, they had a reading, you know, it's every year they have, they want volunteers to come in and read to the students. I think that's uh, doing volunteer reading week or something like that. So at that particular time, I didn't, didn't see any uh, problem, but in talking to teachers afterwards, you know, like when nobody was around, so to speak, and they felt comfortable, <laughs> comfortable to talk to me, the biggest thing is some of the uh, requirements that they have to meet in terms of writing reports and having to fill out a lot of uh, paperwork. I think that was the biggest, biggest thing, and they would like to have more time to just be able to just teach and not have to, uh, and not have to deal with the administrative things. That's the biggest thing I found. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was a follow-up, but you're, you're welcome to ask a question question, or we can pass it on to Aaron. And, and they, they do have the questions you've been posing, so they're looking through those as well. Is there something that catches your eye there? Yes. Yeah. So talking about safety in schools, but not only involvement, and we've, you've hit a lot about on getting students into school, but then what about those students who were um, accused or formerly incarcerated, and how do you keep them connected to education moving forward? Yeah, look, um, this is a really hard question because it is at the intersection of the failures of our juvenile justice system and the failures of our schools. Um, the reality is that when a young person gets contact with the criminal justice system, they are at a fork in the road that can perilously lead to the school to prison pipeline. Um, and one of the things that happens is that when they are in the juvenile justice system, there is even less accountability, even less oversight, even less instruction to make sure that that is a pit stop and not a destination. The reality is that the recidivism rate once a child enters the juvenile justice system is over 80% in Baltimore. Um, that means that we're not teaching them anything that they need to be taught to make sure that they turn the corner. Um, I think there are very specific things that we could do. We could take that moment, that 30 or 60 days when a person first comes into contact with the criminal justice system for something serious enough that they do need to be detained. I'm not talking about shoplifting. I'm not talking about stealing a bicycle from the kid next door. I'm talking about the serious offenses that trigger those detentions. One of the best things we could do at that moment is not necessarily to teach them what they're missing in the classroom, but to evaluate them and diagnose what has gone wrong. You've got 30 to 60 days to try to figure out whether this is a learning disability, whether there's mental health or trauma, whether it's a kid who doesn't have food at home because it's hard to pay attention on an empty stomach. Um, whether those problems are being diagnosed in the schools, I am unsure that it is happening the way it does. But if you have a moment of 30 or 60 days to have people really concentrate on the kids that are at greatest risk, to be able to evaluate them in a way that we frankly ought to be doing. At the opening of this night, I said, I want a mental health specialist in every school. I want our teeth and our eyes checked every day. I want our mental health check for every kid because we can't, we gotta remove the stigma and we gotta be able to understand that what happens in fourth and fifth grade sometimes started in first and second Thank grade. Thank you, Saru. We'll get to you, Saru. We'll, again, we'll talk. Again, we're talking about getting young people back into school when they have been already gone through into the, into the system. Mm -hmm. um, I worked in the prison schools for kids, and most of them, um, this is the first time that they've been going to school on a regular basis. So what needs to be done is just to, to help these students to understand what it's like to go to school and not so much worrying about testing. We're always testing kids, testing, testing kids. Here it's a way, if you can work with them, to find out what they can do and how they can do it, not how they do on testing. And one thing that I found really interesting is I wanted to know who are our prisoners in our prison system right now? And 60% of them come from the Sandtown, Winchester area, and most of them did not have a high school diploma. So we have to put them on a track to get their high school diploma or a trade. So at least they have to graduate from school and we have to incorporate more trades and find out what these students can really do. And plus, we have to help them understand the importance of going to school. And 
Thank you. Thanks. Donald. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> that goes back to what I said earlier. Who says that children, uh, at least I would say, children may not, at least young people, may not, must not necessarily have to go to school every day in the week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. The other days they can do other things like maybe work with a small businessman. I mean, there has to be accountability. I don't mean just not come to school, but I mean, to, but to be in that particular program, they can say, well, on such and such a days I'm working, and because uh, <clears throat> if, if they're not coming to school anyway, they're going to have a failing uh, record in terms of their attendance. So this would help them not have such a uh, negative attendance record, and they could be doing something more productive with their time. I talked to young people in the uh, Sandtown, Winchester area, and many of them, uh, like I said, they're very bright, they're very entrepreneurial, they, you know, they may be selling drugs or whatever, but they have certain skills that should be put to work in a positive type way. And I think that if we can create a non-restrictive type atmosphere for them, that would be great. And I'm very much in favor of being innovative. I, I mean, I think a lot of the problems that we're talking about today, we're t they're based on applying uh, a process that was done in the past. We need to recognize that this is a new day now, and the young people want to do things a little, little differently. So we need to kind of come where they are in their life, in their interests, and see what we can do. That's, I'm a big fan of that because if you, let, if you allow them to take more of a, a decision in terms of what they would like to do or what they can do, and you can evaluate that, that will, make, that will probably motivate them to be more successful into whatever we want them to do. I mean, we, just, we need to engage the kids more, that's all. Every, every time you know, we have these meetings or we have these some uh, these uh, forms and everything is always up at the top what they're doing. You know, it's, all, it's never about the children, what we're going to do to engage them. And I think that's what it should be about, engaging the students. And the only way you can engage them by, by talking to them and asking them what do they want to do. That's the way I look at it. You know. okay. Is there a question there you yeah. think really needs to be addressed? The one that you, the, yes. Go ahead. Um, so we talked about family engagement. We've yeah. talked about money, and the problem that seems to continue to come back is, where is the money? Mm -hmm. But the solutions that we're hearing are, we need more staff, we need truancy officers, we need resource officers, we need books. Where is the money coming from? And how do we do that, especially now that a lot of the extra money that has been distributed through COVID is disappearing? Mm -hmm. So what's the next step? in continuing to fund education in Baltimore City? I really appreciate how that question was framed because this answer might have been different four years ago when you got a $641 million check that could have been invested in our schools to fix the lead pipes that were leaching into the water, to fix the heat and air conditioning. But I'm gonna answer your question because that opportunity has been squandered somewhat. Remember that as mayor, I have pledged to launch an audit into where all that money has been going $300 million has still not been allocated by this administration. We're going to recover that money. And once we've recovered that money, it consistent with what ARPA was meant for, which is to pull ourselves out of the death spiral that COVID caused, we can invest that money in our schools. But even if we weren't in that moment, we have to do a forensic audit of where this money is being spent now. I don't have any problems vesting trust and authority in principles. The debater in me has got to tell you, Wendy and I disagree about this. I want principals and schools to decide for themselves what is best for them. But that doesn't mean you write them a blank check and you say, good luck, let us know how the year goes. You keep track of where that money is going. You keep track of that performance. Do you know that the way we evaluate how much money goes to a school depends on how many kids are in that school on a particular day? Well, guess what? There's a high attendance that day, and the rest of the year, you have that 50 plus percent chronic absenteeism. That is not a way of making sure that we have the right blend of responsibility and accountability, making sure that these principals do have the leverage and the resources that they need, but making sure that we are looking over their shoulders. $1.7 billion is a lot. But it isn't enough if you think about the profound challenges this system faces. We do need to, and I've laid out on theroofermayor.com 
You can go to the blueprint for Baltimore, and we've identified additional sources of revenue. We used to talk about it from cannabis, but we can raise taxes on abandoned and blighted buildings. We can make sure that people that aren't paying their environmental citations, make sure that they do that, and that Thank money's got to come to our schools. Thank you. We'll get a chance to applaud at the end, please. Yes, sir. I think I lost my mic. <laughs> there you go. You're right, we do disagree on that one. We have 164 schools, and if we bring all the money back centrally, then we can buy things centrally in bulk and not expect each principal to figure it out. Also, the principals are figuring out payroll. So payroll needs to have their job back, and let's make sure we can get the teachers at each school, and we can do a better job of have a central location for that also. So then we have to look at other fundings that we haven't been getting. Like there is a, has been a bottle tech since 2015 that is supposed to go to 21st century schools. So how come it's taking so long to get that money in place and get the schools? So we have to work on that. And then we're also supposed to get funding from the casinos and that has gone um, into the general fund and now it's been supposed to be allocated to school. So that's something that I also want to do is I agree with forensic accounting that we have to, day one, let's look at each department of our city and let's find out where the money is going. Because it's a lot of money that is in the Baltimore City school system and the, the whole city itself. So let's find out where that money is going. The other problem that we have with funding is Another problem we have with funding is just like um, not having a lot of work with the community. So once I, you can build partnerships, like I build a partnership with McDonald's at our school, and then they would have a McDonald's light, and then we get some fundraisers from that. So that would be really good. And then we have things that we could do so easily in our city to raise money. In Kentucky, they have their Kentucky Derby, but we have the Preakness, and they make five hundred million dollars in revenue that we could easily use here in the city by having two week celebration of having events all through the city for two weeks to have people come to our city and stay not come from one day and leave so we could copy that and make 500 million then we make a lot of money if we could just run thank you our trains till 3 a.m. to DC and Baltimore we can make a lot more money. thank you what I would do in, in addition to the uh, forensic uh, accounting I would look at the top heavy administrative staff that we have in Baltimore County Public Schools. I think there's two, the uh, administrative uh, staff or the upper office staff, I think they're making, just for those salaries, I think that's too, too big, they should be lowered. And you mentioned uh, about the pregnancy, there are a lot of things that Baltimore City cannot do because you need to get the permission. We can say a lot of nice and happy things but if you don't have the uh, authority from the uh, General Assembly, you can't do those things. And, and I hate to say this, but the General Assembly has been complicit also in the failures of Baltimore. So we need to start looking at these, these uh, some of our legislators and see where they are, because if they don't allow us, the city, to do it, they can't be done. We can come up with all the ideas in the world, but we need to make sure. And another thing that people do not know is that some of the elected officials in the General Assembly, they control, like they can vote on what happens in Baltimore, but they themselves do not represent Baltimore. But they on, on uh, subcommittees and committees that decide things. So you really have to be vigilant and look, as they say, follow the money and see who has the authority to do what. And I'll say this, hate to say it, but there are many people do not want to see Baltimore to get better. They want Baltimore to fail so that certain things can happen that has not happened in 50 years. And I'm, I can go into it later, but the, we do have some sinister people or sinister influences that are dictating what happens in Baltimore. And this is something that needs to be dealt with. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I want you to know, those of you who gave questions, that we have been looking at them carefully in a lot of the subjects we have, I think, touched on as we've been going through here. But there, is there a question you think we haven't that you think we yeah. should get to? 
And we're about to wrap up. As a high school teacher, this is very important to me. So what are your plans to increase the graduation rate in Baltimore City? I've been waiting for that question. <laughs> because the thing I am perhaps most excited to propose for Baltimore, because I don't want to see incremental changes in this city. I want to see dramatic and bold changes. I want Baltimore to become the first city in America to guarantee free college and trade school for any graduate of Baltimore City Public School at any institution in the state of Maryland. Now your colleague is going to ask me, we just talked about how there's not enough money. Where's that going to come from? Well, the son of two math teachers has looked at the math. The reality is that we have 77,000 kids in our school system. It's down to 75,000 now. We lose about 1.8% every year. But we've got 5,000 kids only, 5,500 in our high schools. Less than 1,000 of them graduate. So we're not talking about a large cohort. But one way to encourage parents to stay in the public school system and to get those kids to graduate is to tell them that if they want to go to Lincoln Tech or they want to become a plumber or they want to go to Bowie State or Johns Hopkins or UMBC or Morgan State, that we will remove the financial impediments to it. The reason we can do it at present is because a thousand kids, even if every single one of them did graduate and did do this, the average weighted cost in our state is about $10,000 a kid. It's $10 million a year. Now that's not nothing, that's real money. But $10 million a year is one-sixth of what we spent on police overtime last year. $66 million is what the Baltimore Banner reported we spent in unnecessary police overtime. $460 million budget included in that is overtime on top of that $66 million. God willing, that number goes from 1,000 to 2,000 ki uh, kids who graduate and go to UMBC or Morgan State or Lincoln Tech or Johns Hopkins. $20 million, a third of the police overtime budget to become the first city in America to make this pledge, to make this promise to our children. Not only will it mean that some kids are gonna graduate when otherwise they didn't have a reason to, it means kids are gonna come and stay in this school system. It's the kind of message Thank that we have to it. send if we really are uh, taking seriously the education of our children. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I'm sitting down. <laughs> we can hear you. Go ahead. Just sit down. Yeah. Do it. Just sit. Um, through. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Uh, through we we do have the mayor's promise, and kids can go. Students can go to um, a two-year college here at Community College now. That is a program that we have yeah. now. What I want to do is first we have to start with the middle school students, and what's worked in other states in Tennessee specifically, is they have a buddy program. And you pair with a buddy, or you're helped to get a buddy, and then if both of you go to school and graduate, then each of you get $50 when you graduate. It sounds like a small amount of money, but it works because the kids are, it's when your peers are pushing you to go to school that that is what really works. So we can start that implementing a buddy program then and give a monetary incentive for graduating. The second part that I would like to start doing is <clears throat> you can after you you can have part of your day like you're talking about as your school day that you can make some money and learn a trade at the same time. And also if you're not interested in learning a trade and making some money that way, you can also we're going to encourage more kids to go to the community college while they're in high school so that they can get credits to go towards college before they graduate. And then they're in a different environment. They're seeing other peers go and in college, so that pushes them to do that more. And so by doing that, we're able to encourage kids to do better in high school by giving them the opportunities to, they're gonna be with their buddy, they're gonna make some money, and then they can do trades, and we should have trades in all schools. Like some, right now, I have students that have to get up at like, I don't know, 5 a.m. in the morning so they can get the bus to get across town for the trade they want. So let's make sure that every high school has the trades 
that kids want to do. And so that we're able to not bless kids all around, that have more of a community feeling for all of our schools. And then parents can be more involved with their schools. And if your kid is going to the school where you live, then you're more inclined to be volunteering and going to that school. Thank you. As long as you have to go across town. Thank you. <clears throat> Since there's a um, graduation rate problem, some of the young people, you know, they know that they can, if they drop out of school, well, I can go back in a year or two and get a GED. That's where the attitude some of them take. What I would recommend is that whatever they were going to be taking in doing the GED, why not they just take that course or that particular uh, curriculum in high school? And that will be, that not only will you save money, but you would also help the young person who's in that get further along in their career. They can take, the tra that's why I'm very big on the trades because a lot of the young people who wind up going to get a GED, they go to an uh, institution that has, that has a trade anyway. So why not just have that, beat that up into our public school system and that will eliminate having to waste a lot of money also. Thank you. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, what we're going to do now is allow each candidate to make a uh, one minute closing statement, sort of put a cap on the idea of education in Baltimore City. Through. Me again? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, through. I'm sorry, through. Um, there is no issue or debate more important than this. And I'm disappointed that our current mayor wasn't here to defend what has not been done. And I'm disappointed that fundamentally our school system has not changed in a generation. Many leaders have come into the school system and said that there are problems and they have done little or they've done incremental improvements. There are things that we can point to. But if you want dramatic change, you have to have bold ideas. If you want to have the courage to shake up the system and do something that is worthy of our kids, then you have to do something different than you've always done. With all due respect, I don't want to lower expectations and have our kids only coming to school three days a week. And I think we need more than a buddy system to fundamentally lift us out of this dire situation. My name is Thiru Vignaraja. I'm running for mayor because the school systems of Baltimore saved my family's life and they gave me a chance to do amazing things. I know what the promise of education has been because it has been the foundation of the American dream for our family. But it wasn't just me. It was people like Thurgood Marshall who Thank went you, from... Okay. Oh, I thought there was one minute. Uh, one minute, yeah, you did Just it. kidding. <laughs> Thurufamayor.com, we're the only campaign using public financing. Thank, Thank you, you so much for this important debate. <laughs> Hi, my name, you know, is Wendy Bozell, and I also am doing the public financing too. So it's Wendy for Baltimore.com, and I think it's very telling that Sheila and Brandon both had to. She left early, and then Brandon didn't come, and it's no reason why our truancy rate is so high, 58 percent. If education is, so, they're not here. So usually you follow what you see, your leadership, but. One thing that um, we didn't mention and something that I wanted to get to is that kids, you can tell kids a thousand times what to do, but they're only going to copy what they see. And a lot of our parents didn't have the opportunity to finish high school. So I want to copy a program that's started by Goodwill here in Baltimore City. And they took a high school and that was vacant and they turned it into a high school for adults. It's one thing to go through to a GED, but it's another thing when your kids are gonna see you actually going to a high school and going through that experience also. So that is one thing that I'd like to add to my program is to have a high school for adults, for the parents. Thank you. A minute, a minute shorter than we feel, <laughs> I know. Going to class three days a week is not necessarily lowering the standards. It's the quality that counts. You may, have, you may put more into going to class three days a week because you know on the other two days you'll be able to 
do certain other things, and this is not an automatic thing. The, the young people, what I'm proposing, they would have to qualify to get into that. It's not that they just have an option. They can just come three days a week if they want to. It's not, it's not that cavalier. Another thing I would say is that I'm not entrenched. I am a different political party. The political party that's been running Baltimore for 60 some years, you see what you got. Many of you people are too young to understand it, but just look around and you see what's happening. So I'm not a lawyer, so I don't give you all that nice, pretty type talk, but I'll say this. You need somebody bold, you need someone who's not entrenched, you need someone who has backbone, and you may even need a nice, nice senior citizen who's, <laughs> who's free, you know, I'm free, I can say what I wanna say, you know. So you can go to uh, www.scogginsformayor.com and I'm, I'll be here to talk to anyone afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much, all three of you, I do appreciate it. It's been a very fertile evening, lots of ideas, lots of thoughts, lots of problems addressed. I thank all of you for joining us here in the audience, and I thank everyone who's been watching us on streaming or on your other devices. I appreciate it. And as we say goodbye, we are going to hear from the candidates who chose to tape a statement on their views on education. So thank you so much for being with us, and good night. Now you can cheer.